So now we are in for another treat with our next World Series speaker, Jackie Vanderbrug. Jackie is the Managing Director and Investment Strategist for the Chief Investment Office within the Global Wealth and Investment Management, a division of Bank of America Corporation, which actually includes Merrill Lynch, Wealth Management, and U.S. Trust, and Bank of America Private Wealth Management. She is responsible for defining and executing investment strategies, focusing on impact investing initiatives across all classes, and through her longtime work in the impact investing space, Jackie has helped to lead the development of the field on gender lens investing. In fact, Jackie, a couple years ago in 2016, wrote the first book focused on this issue called Gender Lens Investing, so please check it out. She is a thought leader and a frequent speaker on impact investing and gender lens investing, and is a Aspen Institute First Mover Fellow. So we really have an expert here with us, and I'm sure you will enjoy her talk as much as we've enjoyed meeting and working with her. We're delighted to have Jackie join us and to share her perspectives on the evolution and the power of impact investing to create a sustainable economy and a sustainable world. On women's leadership, she has been a, a true leader and on her own existing journey in the space will be We'll hear more about it, and so please now in welcome Jackie. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. So, I was raised in a home where I was told that I could be anything, but my models we're looking for levers in a changing world. My grandfather moved to Detroit when Henry Ford said he would pay $5 a day. He traded the world of textiles for automation and automobiles. My father in the 60s moved our family to Maryland to be one of the first PhDs in computer science because he had this crazy idea that computers were going to change the world. I was schooled in looking for those innovations that would make a difference. But I was also told that I was supposed to make a difference. So in my grandfather's Dutch reformed Calvinist perspective, this was creation, fall, redemption, and we talked about redeeming the world. These days I'm Episcopalian, so I'm a little more comfortable with co-creating with God. Um, but I would also stand with our Pope in our care for our common home and with my Jewish brothers and sisters in Tikkun Olam to care for and, and redeem the world. How, how is it that we find each other's perspectives in this? Because I'm sure there are many of you in the room who have the same perspective. But for me, it was these two things, right? The look for massive levers in the world and that sense of personal responsibility that led me to some odd places. The halls of Congress, which didn't work out so well, um, starting a tech firm with some folks and taking it public, starting a nonprofit, and then closing a nonprofit, and now Bank of America Wealth Management with $2.7 trillion of client assets looking for levers. So you have to take a step back in terms of how I got there to 12 years ago, 2006, in New York City. I was sitting in a hotel room with a colleague looking at a list of potential limited partners for a new impact investing firm we had audaciously called Good Capital. And we looked at this list, and what we found was that 90% of the names were men. And here it was that the two of us who had worked with some of the world's wealthiest female philanthropists were not thinking of them as potential investors. So we made a conscious choice and we raised 40% of our capital from women. We also got asked by them a question that we found we didn't have the answer for. We got asked by them, what is the impact of these investments on women and gender equality? And so this launched an exploration at the intersection of gender and finance and social change. 
an exploration that began the gender lens investment movement as we know it today, but also changed the course of my career. Because here's what happened. When I started talking to people about what was possible at the intersection um, where their investments could actually have a positive environmental effect and promote gender equality, the response was, you had me at hello. Where do I go? What do I do? And I realized that I had to find a firm that had the resources and the platform and the interest of making change at scale. So before I go any further, though, I do want to say, what do I mean by a gender lens? Because it's important that word lens, right? If I took my glasses off, I would miss a whole lot of your faces, believe me. A lens helps you see things that you would otherwise miss. A gender lens is not about taking half of the population off the table. It is about adding, adding that understanding of how women's realities and needs and leadership may be different or complementary to those of men's. And in investing, adding those gender variables does not mean that we take off the traditional investment analysis. In fact, we see three different ways that gender lenses are used, whether they're looking at access to capital or workplace equality or products and services. But these are not unique. They can blend and, and people use multiple lenses. Let's start with that access to capital question. Because whether she's a micro entrepreneur in Bogota or a high growth entrepreneur here in Boston, whether she's a film director in LA or a fund manager in London, women have less access to capital. It's been called capital punishment. <laughs> uh, and the gap is pretty significant. McKinsey estimates in emerging markets alone, the gap for women-led ventures is $320 billion. We know in the US that women entrepreneurs lead, get less than 7% of venture funding. So I could tell you about their results and about the financial opportunity here. What I will say is we're starting to scale. So in 2013, I went with the IFC to uh, Japan to launch the first women's bond. And since then, they've scaled to a billion dollars. I hope some of you have seen All Rays with this audacious vision that one in four dollars in the tech community would go to a team with at least one woman founder. And what could happen if we were truly inclusive in that space? But this is not just about women entrepreneurs, because you need to take a look at a firm from the board all the way through its value chain to its suppliers and ask that question of how is it that they're getting competitive advantage from inclusion. McKinsey has done a little bit of research and they've found a statistically significant relationship between gender equality in firms and financial profitability. So 21% more likely for that top tier gender inclusive firms to deliver financial returns that's over the industry median. Our own Bank of America lead equity analyst in the US has found that gender inclusive teams have lower price and earnings volatility. I think of a gender lens as actually leading opportunities across the firm, which fits with Harvard Business School research that says teams that have more women, and it's not just teams in the boardroom, it can be teams all throughout the organization are gonna make better decisions. Wall Street's actually starting to understand this opportunity at scale. So we now have gender lens mandate strategies at $910 million as of last year. And US CIF has estimated that almost $400 billion of institutional investor assets have some sort of gender factor incorporated in them. So finally, go from that value chain to the question of if this company is wildly successful, with its products and services, how will that affect gender equality? Because it could be products and services that are specifically about issues that disproportionately affect women, say healthy childbirth or safety. But just as often, it's products and services that are made for all but not necessarily designed for all. So as an example, 
When do you think in the US that we mandated that both male and female crash test dummies would be, des would be tested in the driver's seat of cars? In 2011. I was driving before then, by the way. Um, so there actually would be a huge economic opportunity in closing the gender gap in areas like water and healthcare and telecommunications and energy. Estimated at $300 billion of additional spending per year. But rather than unpack these, I'm gonna to go to one that's a little closer to home for me, which is financial services. A lot can be said about women's experience with financial services. One thing is very clear, women are increasingly wealthy. In fact, in the US today, women control $14 trillion of investable assets. Just to put that in perspective, that's bigger than the combined GDP of India and China. This is not an area that wealth management is going to miss. And second fact, not surprisingly, women's wants and needs in this area are not identical to men's. So we see that 40% of women, the top interest of women is fulfilling their goals. The top interest of men, beating the market. <laughs> women are also more likely to be interested in impact. In fact, a third of women say that they have not yet made an impact investment, but they are interested. They're in that aspirational gap. Men are interested in impact investing increasingly as well, but the motivations are different. So when you unpack why are you interested in impact investing, women are significantly more likely to say it's because they're passionate about an, a particular area, specifically one of their top areas, the environment. They're still interested in market rate returns. In fact, they believe they will get market rate returns, but their driving motivation is impact. And 41% of women regret not investing more. It's their top regret. My forecast is 20 years from now, their top regret may be not investing with their interest in high-performing, sustainable, gender-inclusive companies. So what we have here is investors increasingly interested in gender factors, and women increasingly wealthy and interested in impact. I lead impact investing for Bank of America Wealth Management, and we are democratizing access to impact. So from our online brokerage, where you can now see the ESG scores of your investment, to total portfolios and impact starting at $5,000, to our work with the largest institutions to in integrate ESG into their investment policy statements. It's not gonna surprise you, I am a passionate believer that our ability to help our clients understand the impact economics, that the social is economic, and to give them opportunities across this spectrum is an essential lever in our work to close that clean trillion dollar gap. But I would posit that there's another one, that the integration of gender into sustainable finance is a lever that we have yet to fully explore. It's not that we aren't sort of talking about it. In fact, if you look at the Paris Agreement, it calls for gender equality. It calls for women's empowerment. It calls for the adoption of gender-related adaptation measures. And the UNDP has five, count them five, four-hour training modules at the intersection of gender and finance. But what I'd say is for our firm, and I think we're probably not alone, they tend to live in different areas, right? So we have led a coalition to move $10 billion to catalytic climate finance. We are a leader in green bonds, and we have a $125 billion climate finance initiative. We are also a leader in inclusion. We are a signatory to the 30% coalition. We are on the Bloomberg Gender Equality Index. We move capital to women entrepreneurs. We are only starting to look at what the potential is at that intersection. 
what's possible if we add a gender accelerator to our green bonds? What would really happen if our municipal finance team could fully understand the unique transit needs of women? What would be the impact if we brought what we know about inclusive teams into our negotiations with high growth uh, renewable energy firms? There is this opportunity at the intersection that is still to be explored and questions to be asked. There's a set of things we know. For instance, we know in agriculture that if women farmers had the same access to agricultural inputs, water, seed, agri uh, fertilizer, that they would raise their output by 20 to 30% and that would drop the number of malnourished people in the world by 12 to 17%. How is it that we can get them access to credit? How could we support them with childcare so they could take advanced irrigation classes? How is it that we can move refrigeration closer to their plots of land so that we reduce food waste? Or take energy, because we know that women as household managers are more likely to have impact on energy decisions and that 25% of black carbon emissions come from that residential fuel burning. So what would happen if we really dug in and asked questions about the role of women in the design in the manufacturing and in the distribution of those firms that are looking to do distributed energy at scale. And water, we heard a lot about water today. Um, we know that 50% of the world's population is going to be living in water stressed areas by 2030. This puts 45% of global GDP at risk by the middle of the century. How is it that we can enable women who literally bear the world's water on their shoulders to integrate the tribal councils and to integrate our water utility boards to agitate for action and accountability in this area. So these are far from the only integration points. I've named three. I haven't even gotten to girls' education, family planning, number six and seven on Project Drawdown. I guess my point is there is no conversation at this conference where gender is not relevant. And my clients across the wealth spectrum, but especially my female clients, as well as my institutional clients who are laser focused on risk, would find products at this intersection very compelling. I feel like we're in this moment, this moment where clients across the wealth spectrum, again, especially female clients, are ready and eager to move capital to sustainable investments. And sustainable investments will benefit from the integration of gender equality to drive returns and to drive impact. I don't think I could find a bigger lever I never met my grandfather, but I honestly think he would be proud. Thank you.